Okay, away you go, Mike. All right, so as I say, first an apology. Um, for the first time for one of these, I'm really, really badly organised. I did get started several months ago, um, but obviously, as we all know, life gets in the way. And um, we, and we were on holiday a fortnight ago, and I was under strict instructions not to do anything while we were away. And it was, it was our, our little boy's first holiday, so I came back Monday of this week expecting every night to be working, and then wasn't very well, and then planned to finish everything off last night, realised the train strike was this morning and rushed to try and make other arrangements, ended up having to get a bus and a train to stay at my mum's in Darling last night and so yes, Thank this you. is how we are where we are. <laughs> yeah. So what what I'm really planning on doing and proposing to do is because it's such a skeleton um, presentation that I've got is that this is kind of a bit of a dry run for what I'm... I'll do the finished version of Canterbury in April. Um, so I'll give the... which is basically the first page of what the, entr the, the introduction is, and then I'm going to go in using um, the... Um, what's on the website? Um, is it Ira David? David Wood? I can't remember. It's, he's done the... Yeah, um, anthology of events. So I'm going to go, what I've got is I've, I've got um, specific dates between September and November that I'm going to go into and comment a little bit on and then if, after that we have a conversation about the different bits and also look back on the other presentations that I've done. Um, and dates way back to his, to Oswald's uh, childhood. So um, to start off, did anybody watch Bodyguard? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As I was watching that, um, and obviously discussing as it was going on with my wife, um, I think to me that's almost exactly what we always talk about in the way things happen and how everything happens behind the scenes, and then the argument is always, oh, it's just some. Uh, drama that's been written. My argument is always, well, if somebody can think those things up, the intelligence services are going to use those kind of people with those kind of ideas to do things in real life. Um, so I just I wanted to bring it up because it's relevant to what I'm going to be talking about and what we're all going to be talking about. So I'll go back into the start. It's basically the first page and then we'll go into the, the dates. So, in advance of the April 2015 conference, I started writing a paper that I thought would end up being a similar length to the previous presentations I've given at Canterbury. I had no idea at the time that it would take on a life of its own and expand to the point that it would take me another three and a half years to complete. And it's still not complete. But such is the life of a Kennedy assassination researcher. Somehow, though, after two new jobs, moving house, three foreign holidays, getting married, and the arrival of Baby Jack, Baby Jack I'm finally here today with the final part of Fingerprints of Intelligence, which isn't accurate, which is, as I've said, because it isn't finished. You remember the phrase comes from an interview Senator Richard Schweiker, Republican of Pennsylvania, gave following his work on the Church Committee in the mid 1970s. Quote, we don't know what happened, but we do know Oswald had intelligence connections. Everywhere you look with him, there are the fingerprints of intelligence. In the first part of what has become a three-part presentation, we looked at some of the most suspicious links Oswald had to intelligence activity, beginning with his childhood interest in espionage, moving into his youth where he was involved with the Civil Air Patrol, before joining the Marines in 1956 as a young adult. A strange thing for a Marxist to do. Indeed. We then moved on to talk in detail about Oswald's defection of the Soviet Union in 1959. Less strange, perhaps. Fake. The similarity of his situation to that of several other young men with a background in the US military. The journey he took across the Atlantic into Europe and how it was funded. His experience arriving and living in Russia and his whirlwind romance and marriage to Marina. 
In part two, we found the Oswalds returning to the United States in 1962, with, with, with surprising ease, given he was technically a traitor at the height of the Cold War. I talked in detail about the work Oswald did with military and, and, with military and intelligence linked companies like Jagger Charles Doval, and about the people he mixed with, including most prominently George de Monchild. We looked at the paper trail and the logistics of Oswald's apparent purchase of the weapons that would supposedly be used to shoot at General Walker and kill President Kennedy and Officer Tippett. In most detail, we discussed Oswald's association with Guy Bannister and his behaviour in New Orleans during the summer of 1963. Today, in part three, I'm going to look at the final three months of Oswald's life, from September through the lead up and day of the assassination of the President and the death, death of the accused assassination in, uh, assassin in November. So, we're talking about starting in September 1963. Um, the first main event that happens there is the supposed meeting um, between Maurice Bishop and Antonio Bessiana in what's since been identified as the Southland Centre uh, in Dallas. Um, that's the event where Bessiana goes to meet the pre-arranged with Maurice Bishop and there's a young man there that he identified as Oswald but the over the years, the, 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 the debate has been whether Morris Bishop is actually David Atley Phillips, and of course, Bessiana identified as, him as such last year. Um, so, I mean, I've got here, Antonio Bessiana claims Morris Bishop introduces him to Lee Harvey Oswald at a meeting in Dallas this month. David Atley Phillips is running the CIA's covert operations out of its Mexico City station. It has long been speculated that Phillips is really Morris Bishop, who was eventually identified by exile leader Bessiana, speaking to congressional investigators in 1978 as his case officer, involved in numerous uh, assassination plots against Castro. Although Phillips' physical description is a near match for that provided by Bessiana, the exile has never positively identified Phillips as Bishop. Now obviously that's not accurate because he, last year he did say it was him. Uh, Phillips, who died in 1988, denied using the alias all working with Vesiana. Just days prior to Oswald's visit to Mexico City, uh, the CIA's David Atley Phillips is promoted and assigned new duties as Chief of Cuban Operations in Mexico City. Uh, September the 2nd, Oswald reportedly visits his uncle Charles Murray in New, York, New Orleans. Otherwise, Oswald has not been seen by anyone since August the 21st. He will not publicly resurface again until September the 17th. Um, September the 15th, you have Perry Russo, who was the, the, uh, the guy that in JFK that's portrayed by Kevin Bacon, although that was more of an amalgamation of several other characters, but the main part is it was Russo. He was an insurance agent and acquaintance of David Ferry, and he attended a party at Ferry's apartment. Ferry introduces him uh, uh, to a Leon Oswald, who Russo will later be unable to positively identify as being Lee Harvey Oswald, although that's um, open to debate. Russo maintains that after a long night of drinking, Fe Ferry Leon, several anti Castro Cubans, and a tall, distinguished looking white haired man introduces Clem Bertrand, most probably Clay Shaw, began discussing how to assassinate Castro. After the Cubans leave, Ferry reportedly begins place, uh, pacing the room with a perpetual mug of coffee in his hand. Taking, talking of a plan to get rid of JFK and blame it on Castro. He speaks of a triangulation of crossfire as the best means to assassinate the president. Um, you then have September the 17th, CIA operative William George Godet, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, I'm used to it, <laughs> uh, gets a visa to go to Mexico along with an allegedly have the Oswald. They have the, the, the basically the, the, the serial, the, serial, no. the, 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 next, the number. TRU does the same thing with their, with their yeah, cars, yeah. They suspicious. come by train, though. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, I mean, passports. <laughs> tourists. So his office in New Orleans is a stone's throw from uh, 5544 Camp Street in New Orleans. Uh, Right. So this is around the time where all of the um, dual sightings start, where a lot of it in Harvey and Lee's where um, 
that tries to be broken down into who is what where, where in so many different instances, you can't be in two places at once. So that's one of the, the space incident on the shooting range? Well, there, there are, there's a lot of, a lot of instances of on the shooting range, there's one particular shooting range when he's... He cross-shoots on the target. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes a real That's, that's so. later on to go over, but... Yeah. He can't be in two places at once. Yeah. And, you, and there's an antique oh. shop or something, where someone, someone shop, was looking yeah. to... I'm looking to get a rifle modified or... Yes, and he, because and it used to be a gun shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says gu uh, guns and ammo. And interesting, he had a yeah. wife and two kids as well. Yeah, but it's supposed to be in Mexico. And you could drive. Yeah. Or somebody's in Mexico. And a full Yeah, full Um, So, September the 25th, uh, on this day, Oswald is supposed to be somewhere between New Orleans and Mexico on a bus. A person claiming to be, uh, to be Oswald presents himself at the Selective Service Office in Austin, Texas. He's there for 30 minutes discussing what he might do about his dishonorable discharge from the Marine Corps. Um, in Mexico, an O.H. Lee registers at the Hotel de del Comercio, a meet, which is traditionally a meeting place for anti-Castro Cuban exiles. Sometime between 8 in the morning and noon, Oswald cashes a Texas employee, um, unemployment check at a Winn-Dixie store at 4303 Magazine Street in New Orleans. So again, all these different places. On the bus to Mexico City, Oswald reportedly sits next to a man identified as Albert Osborne. Albert Osborne is really Jack Bowen, as he had finally enlisted the FBI. When Oswald is captured following the assassination, we we're we're told he had a library card in his wallet with Jack Bowen's name on it. This card later disappeared from the evidence. Later, when three tramps are arrested in Dealey Plaza, immediately following the assassination, one of the names used by the older tramps will be Albert Alexander Osborne. He will also use the name Howard Bowen. So this is where, again, the coincidences start to build up. Now... Well, are you calling on false names? Yes. <laughs> yes. Project funds. They don't make them at these. <laughs> uh, right, now, September the 26th, Oswald's in Mexico, yet someone introduced as Oswald visits Sylvia Odio, a Cuban exile in Dallas. Oswald uh, is also reported to be in New Orleans this day. Um, one of the men accompanying Oswald is known only as Leopold. Uh, Leopoldo or something? Yeah, it's Leopoldo. Uh, the other guy says that American is crazy. Right, so Oswald reportedly on the same day is crossing the Mexican border. Following the assassination, the FBI will find a receipt from a Laredo, Texas store in Oswald's belongings. The receipt is for $32 worth of clothing. Right, so September the 27th, uh, this is where Oswald's um, registered at the hotel. Sylvie Duran, uh, who is the... Um, who works in the Cuban, Mexico, uh, Cuban embassy in Mexico City, says Oswald visits her office that day to apply for a visa. She calls the Soviet embassy and is told Oswald's application for a visa will take three to four months to process. Uh. Informed of this, Oswald gets angry. Duran has to call for help from the Cuban council, who gets into a shouting match with Oswald and finally tells him to get out. All calls on the morning of um, the 27th of September in Spanish. Um, he mentions Odessa as a destination. Uh, right, okay. So that's the 27th. The 28th, uh, Malcolm, this is where the sports drone rifle range um, in Dallas is first mentioned. And the, the first guy that mentions in the Warren Commission, this is Malcolm Price. He remembers helping sight Oswald's rifle in. Oswald, again, is in Mexico City. How can they both be in the same place? Uh, in Mexico City, Oswald comes back to the embassy, and it's a Saturday when the embassy is officially closed. After a brief session with officials there, he goes back to the Soviet embassy and suggests that the Soviet embassy in Washington might be able to resolve the impasse. A series of telephone calls between today and October the 1st are made by Oswald, or somebody impersonating him, to and from the Cuban and Soviet consulates in Mexico City. The CIA make tapes of these conversations. The CIA will eventually report that these tapes were routinely destroyed before the assassination. There are, however, FBI documents which contain detailed accounts of how two of the tapes were listened to after the assassination by FBI agents familiar with Oswald's voice. 
I'll come back to that in a minute. When Sylvia Durand testifies before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, she will emphatically state that Oswald does not return to the embassy on Saturday the 28th, and she does not call the Soviet uh, consulate on his behalf on this day. Can I just... Yeah, uh, because she was a Mexican, right? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Working, working employed. Work, work employed in Mexico City in the Cuban embassy, yeah. Right, so same day, um, Silvio Odio gets a call from Leopoldo, who was one of the guys that had come to see her, and asked what she thought of the American uh, that had visited her. He did, uh, I didn't think anything, she said. Leopoldo then tells Odio that Oswald is an ex-Marine who is kind of nuts. Oswald has told the Cubans. Leopoldo claims that they didn't have any guts because uh, Kennedy should have been assassinated off the Bay of Pigs. Some Cubans should have done that because he's the one who is holding the freedom who is holding the freedom of Cuba. Right. So Did he the, also the, indicate that he was a bit of a, a nutter, a hard nut? Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, and that somebody should go and do it. He, um, he, he's gone low cost. Yeah, he was but w was he using the, the... I thought it was Leon. He wasn't using Oswald. No, no this... No, Leopoldo no, is telling... Leopoldo, Leon. yeah. He's telling... But, but Os, Oswald wasn't using his name. No, no, during the, it was the, the American Leon. That was, oh, that was he did was say yeah. not Oswald. He had a certain right. porn. No. 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 No, it was just, it was Leopoldo, I haven't got a note of it. Well, these were what they called war names. War names, exactly. <laughs> so, um, macho. to go back to the, what's actually happening in Mexico City at the same time, both the Cuban consulate and the Soviet consulate are closed on September the 28th. Sylvia Duran has testified repeatedly on September the 28th, Oswald is not in the Cuban embassy, where there are voices alleged to have been overheard. Uh, Oleg Nechuporienko of the Soviet embassy is the chief source supporting the claim that Oswald is in the Soviet embassy on September the 28th. Yet he has stated on video that the telephone switchboard was closed on September the 28th and that there could have been no phone conversations on that day. The voice said to be Oswald is reportedly that of the first Kostikov intercept, and if so, not that of the Dallas Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Kostikov is the, um, the consulate who is in the Russian embassy, who is actually the um, assassinations expert for the KGB. So the argument there is either was Oswald working for Soviet intelligence and that was some kind of setup, or was it being sold in that way by the American intelligence agencies as part of the cut out. I blame it on the Russian biography to make blame oh, no, on the Russians. On the blame it on the Russians, of course, the la as LBJ said, was the last thing was. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it depends yeah. who's doing the planning for the assassination and what the plan was to put things in place. So, again, the same day where all these other things are happening, this is where we go back to Mr. Price at the Sports Drone Rifle Range in Dallas. Um, at that point, remember, Oswald is supposed to be driving a 1940 Model Ford. He can't drive, doesn't have a driving license. Now, not having a driving license at that point, and in some cases even today, doesn't, it doesn't stop people from actually driving a car. The physical driving of a car, you might not be allowed to do it. See what people can do it. But he, a cop, apparently, couldn't drive it. There's, there's other examples of later in that month into October where Ruth Payne's actually giving him driving lessons yes. and his coordination's horrendous. He, can't, he literally can't do it. Now, that's obviously relevant to whether somebody can fire a rifle as well. Um, so September the 30th, Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly returns to the Russian embassy in Mexico City for a final attempt to get his transit visa. A guard, apparently unacquainted with Oswald's case, asks to who Oswald has spoken to previously at the embassy. Oswald explains that he has seen Comrade Kostikov on September the 28th. This is the detail about Kostikov. Now, although listed merely as an attaché consular office on the embassy roster, has been identified for some time as an intelligence officer for the KGB, who specialises in handling Soviet agents operating under deep cover within the United States. The FBI has recently followed another Soviet agent from the US into Mexico and observed his contact with Kostikov. He's also suspected of being part of the 13th Department of the KGB, which is involved in planning sabotage and other violent acts. Right, we're now into October the 1st. Today, somebody identifies as self as Lee Harvey Oswald calls the Soviet consulate in Mexico City. 
This individual indicates that he's visited the Soviet consulate at least once and inquires about the telegram the consulate sent to Washington, D.C., requesting more information regarding Oswald and Marina. Fourteen minutes later, the consulate receives another phone call. This time, the caller identifies himself as Lee Harvey Oswald and asks about the telegram sent to Washington. Other evidence from the CIA and witness testimony indicates that the individual visited the Soviet and Cuban consulates on five or six different occasions. While the majority of the evidence tends to indicate that this individual was indeed Lee Harvey Oswald, the possibility that someone else is using Oswald's name during this time in contact with the Soviet and Cuban Cuban consulates cannot be absolutely dismissed. Uh, there is a memo from Hoover to James Rowley, who is the Secret Service Chief. The, set quote, the Central Intelligence Agency advised that on October the 1st, 1963, an extremely sensitive source had reported that an individual identifies him, uh, identified himself as Lee Oswald, who contacted the Soviet Embassy in Mexico City, inquiring to us as to any messages. Special agents of this bureau who have conversed with Oswald in Dallas, Texas, this is the day of the assassination. Yeah. Have observed photographs of the individual re referred to above and have listened to his voice. These special agents are of the opinion that the above referred to individual was not Lee Harvey Oswald. And that, that's, that's bloody Hoover. Hoover. That's Hoover in a memo. Yeah. From the, new uh, from the new cables and memos, it appears likely that the tapes upon a special plane to Dallas on the evening of November 22nd arrived in the Love Field at 2.57 a.m. local time on the morning of the 23rd. They, their unspecified agents listen to them and conclude that the voice on the tapes do not match that of the captured Lee Oswald. But later that day, a CIA cable mysteriously asserts that one of the tapes has been routinely erased prior to the assassination. Hard to listen to. Yeah. By the following day, the official story holds that all tapes have been recycled prior to the assassination. However, there is now enough in the, recording, in the record concerning the tape's existence that there is every reason to believe that these later cables in fact represent the beginning of the cover-up. Oswald uh, allegedly departs Mexico City by bus on October the 2nd. He arrives in Dallas uh, on October the 3rd. Then you get another phone call. An unidentified man phones the Soviet embassy in Mexico City at 3.39 p.m. speaking in broken Spanish, then English, saying he is looking for a visa to Russia. This man does not identify himself as Oswald. Uh, again, as Oswald leaves Mexico at Nuevo Laredo at 1.30 a.m., Mexican records list Oswald's departure by automobile. The one commission says that Oswald leaves Mexico by bus and arrives in San Antonio by 6.30 a.m. At about 6, 6 p.m. on the same day, Oswald is reported to be in Alice, Texas, some 400 miles south of Dallas, 100 miles east of Laredo, and about 40 miles west of the Gulf City of Corpus Christi. He reportedly drives up to a radio station in a battered 1953 model car and asks about a job. He's told to return the next day and speak to the manager. Around 6.30 or 7 p.m. in Texas, 35 miles west of Alice, Oswald is reportedly in a cafe asking the waitress if she knows of any job opportunities nearby. She tells him there was a plant open up in the, uh, nearby in November. A woman resembling Marina Oswald, as well as a child of two to four years, and a newborn baby, perhaps two, week, two weeks old, accompanies him. Um, June, uh, Rachel's not born until October the 20th, so someone's gone and arrived there, either the, the, the dates that have been given after the assassination, or people are moved, being moved around on the chessboard at the wrong time. Compare the above information with the following. On the evening of October the 3rd, Oswald is also known to have checked into the Dallas YMCA, where he remains for three nights. On October the 4th, he applies for a job at the Paget Printing Company on Industrial Boulevard in, in Dallas. Dallas, uh, Texas is a big state, so how, how can he be in so many different places at once? Um, he spends the afternoon and night with his friend and child at the Payne residence in Irving. On October 7th, he requires about a room and a boarding house at 1026 North Beckley Avenue in Dallas and is told that none are available. Soon after this, he rents a nearby room at 621 Marsalis Street. According to Maria Oswald and Ruth Payne, Marina is with Ruth Payne in Irving, Texas throughout this time in the ninth month of her pregnancy with Rachel. Oswald spends the day of October 7th in Dallas looking for an apartment. He rents one from Mary Bledsoe in Oak Cliff under his own name, but she soon becomes uncomfortable with him and asks him to leave. October the 14th, Oswald finds Mrs. Uh, A.C. Johnson has a tiny cubicle with a room for rent at $8 a week at 1026 North Beckley. He takes the room, pays for the first week, and then registers under the name O.H. Lee. 
October the 15th, Oswald goes to the Texas Book Depository building to see Ruth Roy Truly about getting a job. He gets it. His hours are from 8 in the morning until 4.45 in the afternoon. His lunch period is from 12 to 12.45. His pay is $1.25 an hour. He starts work the following day. Now those um, times are important for later things that happen across the next month because of other sightings and the fact that we know for a fact, or at least the record suggests, he's at work every single day. The other strange thing is that who, who identifies the job at the book depository? Well, it's Mrs. Payne. Um, the strange thing is, the Texas Employment Commission tried to contact Oswald, speak to Mrs. Payne, give information about a job at Love Field, which is actually higher paid than the job he ends up taking at the book depository. Now, that's suspicious, firstly, because there's no evidence Oswald ever learned about it. If he did, surely he'd get the, take the higher paid job as a baggage handler. I mean, you're either moving baggage or you're moving books. What's the difference? He's not, I, mean, I can't imagine anybody would decide <laughs> you'd rather move books than bags. Yeah. Um, particularly when you're going to get paid more. The other side of that is, of course, it's suspicious that it's at Love Field. Just remind me again, uh, Ruth Payne's knowledge about the job at the book depository came from Linny May Randall, did it? Or have I heard yes. about it? No. Yes, no. supposedly. That's 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 yes. Who is. Always use that word, supposedly. Supposedly, yes. Uh, relatively. Uh, Randall is uh, Wesley Fraser's sister. sister. And the Paynes obviously have a lot of intelligence links, both Michael and Ruth. My intent um, is to go into that. In well, I, I, I think they do, but yes, allegedly, supposedly. Um, I'll get into more of that in, 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 the, in April. Um, right, now this is the next important bit. October the 18th, the, the INS, the Immigration and Nationalisation Service Office in Dallas, which is, has now heard about Oswald's Soviet embassy contacts. And that, they relayed the story to James Hosty, who's the FBI agent, um, given the case. 18 days after the assassination, Hoover will censor Hosty for failing to properly react to the receipt of this information. And then there's obviously Hosty makes it either by desire or incompetence, which we don't know, makes a complete <coughs> balls up of the whole thing from that point on. Didn't he famously burn the note or destroy no, the note? No, Shankin asked him to flush it down the toilet, but I will, I will get to that. Uh, October the 20th is the date that Marina gives birth to the, the Oswald's second child. Um, is given the name Audrey Marina Rachel Oswald. Right, now this bit's quite lengthy, but it's important. I'm, it's verbatim from what I've got because it's much better than the way I would have worded it. October the 23rd, the CIA requests a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald to check against its own files. This is related to the whole thing that's going on with them trying to get a visa back to Russia. So. Oswald's DD-1173 identity card is supposedly postmarked on this date. The DD-1173 bears Oswald's photo, the circular seal of the US Department of Defense, and what appears to be a postmark date October 23, 1963, less than a month before the assassination. The US Marine Corps issued Oswald the identity card on September 11, 1959, nine days after his request for a dependency discharge from the Marine Corps was approved. His stated reason for the request was to support his mother, Marguerite, then living in Fort Worth. He actually, I've covered that in one of the previous presentations where he never actually went, he spent like a day with her, I can't remember the exact length of time. But, yeah, and then, then, then to jack her on herself or something. Yeah, it's yeah. Lame. lame excuse, no reason at all. It, then, it, Could you just go over this, this ID card? This oh, it, 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 the, that, you, it'll become more self-explanatory when I come back to the... Now, this is a new ID, new military or ex-military ID it's card? The, the question is why he's actually issued with this card at the point oh. that he was issued with it at all, yeah. Because he was he had been dishonorably discharged exactly, in yeah. absentia yes. after going to Russia. So he shouldn't, have, he shouldn't have had it. Uh, so five weeks after receiving the card issued at El Toro Naval Air Station, Santa Ana, California, Oswald crosses the Finnish Soviet border on his way to Moscow. Uh, two weeks later is when he announces his intention to defect to the Soviet Union. So why has he got this card? He shouldn't have it. Oswald's military record notes the identity card was issued in accordance with paragraph 3014, uh, personal records and accounting manual. 
However, this paragraph pertains only to the issuance of USMC member cards and does not apply to a DD1173. The appropriate card for the discharged Oswald, as stipulated by the PRAM, would have been a 2MC res, reflecting his new status in the Ready Reserve. Well, it's based, to cut a long story short, it's indicating he's still an active member of the US military. Uh, that's not possible. Ah, uh, well. Well, I'm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Kim Miller, Washington. a Washington spokesman for the Marines, said Oswald could have been issued a DD-1173 for one of two reasons. Because of an injury while on an active duty entitled him to medical privilege. He or shot, shot himself in the foot or He did. Or because he was a civilian employee overseas needed military ID. Uh, which he wasn't. Well, was wasn't. Was but records do not show an injury to Oswald. Not at that point. The injury was... Um, but he was uh, in he, Japan. He served time in the brig for... for yes, but th that was all yeah. much earlier. Can I just interject? Of course you can. Um, I'm sure I read recently, what was his um, dishonourable discharge not actually given until about a year after he defected? There was some kind of administrative some, delay. Yes, and some time, uh, it, it wasn't immediate. I, I, I just wonder whether somebody in some office somewhere thought, Oh shit! We haven't dis we haven't dishonourably discharged it. This won't look right. We better get it done so it, it looks proper. You know, it just seems you know As he's got military active military ID. He's not discharged. It seems a bit like yeah, civil service. As, As an administrator, in I, I do not discount that. Okay. Is that it, okay. That is, I do know that that kind of thing. Okay. 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 Uh, I, I, I would have thought the Russians would be very interested in seeing his military. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Just Dennis Vila, uh, reference historian of the U.S. Army Military History Institute of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, reached a similar finding. He notes issuance of DD-1173 was regulated under the Department of Defense guidelines at the time Oswald received the card. These guidelines limited recipients of such cards largely to military dependents and, quote, civilian and required military identification. If such a card was issued in error, says Vlock, it wouldn't have been authorised and immediately upon being called to official attention would have been changed or revoked. Which suggests possibly it wasn't administrative error. Maybe, maybe not. Possibly. Possibly. There is no evidence Oswald's identity card was revoked even, if, even after he defected, threatened yeah. to provide military secrets to the Russians and received an undesirable discharge from the Marine Corps. Oswald's card did not expire until December the 7th, 1962, when he was already back in, in the United States. Oswald's card will not be printed in the photographic evidence of the Warren Commission's report on the Kennedy assassination, but the head on photograph, the, the photograph of his head and shoulders on DD-1173 will be the same as two other Oswald photos included in the report. One is Warren Commission Exhibit 2892, identified by the FBI as photo taken in Minsk. The Mint's photo has a white circular cut out in the lower right hand corner corresponding to the overlapping postmark on the Defence Department card. The Mint's contradiction, Oswald's trip to Russia occurred after the issuance of the DOD identity card was not evident to the Commission, apparently because the FBI did not make the card available to its members. There's a surprise. In December 1966, when the FBI finally released Oswald's Defence Department identity card to the National Archives, it arrived nearly obliterated by FBI testing. That's cool. According to archivist Sue McDonough of the Civil Reference Branch. The colour of the image, the printing, everything is gone. You couldn't use it to show anything. Challenging the archivist's assertion, FBI spokesman Bill Carter of the Public Affairs Office in Washington asks, how does she know the FBI tested it? Does she have a report? Who else but the FBI could have done it? McDonough responds. She adds that there are no pictures of the card in its unobliterated state in the archives. According to assassination writer David Lifton, there is no mention of DD-1173 in any FBI testing reports he has received. These include non-published commission documents, FBI Dallas Field Office reports and FBI summary reports to the Warren Commission. The same photo of Oswald on DD-1173 also appeared in the Warren Report. On a phony selective service classification card found in Oswald's possession with the name Alec James Heidel, the name he supposedly used to purchase the rifle by mail order. It was the 112th Army Intelligence Group at Fort Sam Houston that notified the FBI that he was carrying a fraudulent selective service card. 
How the military knew this has never been explained. The Hidal card with its photograph of Oswald was one of two major links between Oswald and the assassination weapon. The other is a photograph known by its commission designation of 133A, allegedly taken of Oswald, brandishing the weapon in the backyard of the home in the Old Cliff area of Dallas. The 26 volume one commission publication acknowledged the existence of the DOD identity card in only two places. Oswald's military record and the report of FBI agent Manning Clements, who listed the contents of Oswald's wallet on the night of November 22nd, 1963. Now, my question is there is which wallet? Because <laughs> I think there's about three. <laughs> after, the inter uh, after the Army Intelligence tip, Clements cited both the DOD identity card and the Heidel card. Clements' report, however, did not reveal that the two cards had the same picture or that the DOD identity card had a photo at all. The October 23, 1963 postmark on Oswald's DOD identity card is a further enigma. If found, drop in any mailbox, the card's reverse side instructs. It then tells the postmaster to return to the Department of Defense, Washington, DC, Washington 25, D.C. Robert Blakey, former general counsel of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, considered the possibility that the card was lost, dropped in the mailbox, uh, mailbox postmarked and delivered to the Defense Department. In that case, it's Blakey, defence would have had to have given it back to Oswald. Interesting. Right. Now, I think for the whole thing of this identity card, um, Liebler, Wesley Liebler, an associate counsel of the Warren Commission, expresses similar surprise at the convolutions of Oswald's mysterious ID card. Quote, this is all new to me, he says. Two things seem odd. The picture identified as Oswald in Minsk and the postmark on the defence card. The postmark implies the Defence Department either mailed it back to him or gave it to him at some time. So is this some rogue person sending it back in the post? As like you said, perhaps that could be your ass situation, sending it back to somebody in the post when um, they've realised something's gone amiss. Or is it something more suspicious? Um, when is the postmark, Evan? Do we know what the date of the postmark is when it was actually posted to... Um, to, 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 